Hear now this reading from the book of Genesis. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is it you've done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel, his wife, and Laban gave his mate Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her man. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban for another seven years. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Well, today the lectionary brings us, I think, one of the funniest and the strangest stories in the Holy Bible. And it gets even more so from the point that we read. Jacob is now living among his mother's people, her brother Laban and his daughters, Leah, the oldest. She was kind of a nice girl with a good personality. <laughs> but Rachel was beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. See, when Jacob arrived in the land, he was waiting at the well for the water to be drawn, and that's when Rachel appeared. Something of a show off, Jacob rolled the stone off of the well and then watered all of Rachel's flocks. And when he was done, he grabbed her and kissed her. Now Laban seems to be glad to have had this kinsman around. Laban was a little proud. He seems to have thought, it's going to be pretty handy to have this strong young man around who can do some things for me. So after a month of watching Jacob, he makes him an offer. Kinsman, you shouldn't work for nothing. Name me your wages. And young Jacob knew exactly what he wanted. He wanted Rachel. And so excitedly, he said, I'll work for seven years if you give me Rachel. Brett Laban liked this bargain. He struck it, agreed to it. Jacob works the seven years. And I love how the passage conveys that he was so well struck at the scene. So once the seven years were complete, Jacob was ready. He goes into Laban and basically says, give me my wife so I can have sex with her. Though our modern English translations clean that up. <laughs> so Laban plans a wedding, he invites all the people to be his guest. Everyone celebrates, they have a good time. Laban makes sure that Jacob's had lots of wine. And then, when the evening comes, Jacob is drunk, he goes into bed with his new wife. Then you can just imagine the scene. The next morning, the sun breaks through the windows, Jacob's got a little bit of a headache. He rolls over to cuddle up with his beautiful new wife, and then starts screaming and awakes everybody in the house. Because it's Leah, not Rachel. I can just imagine Jacob comes running out of the bedroom, he encounters Leah, and what have you done to me? And then later, crafty, matter of fact, well, we don't do such things in this land, didn't you know? We don't give the younger daughter to be married before the oldest, but here's what we'll do. Complete the week of wedding celebration of this daughter, and then I'll give you the other one. 
in exchange for another seven years of work. Well, what's Jacob to do? He wants Rachel. So he agrees. And a week later, he's married to Rachel, whom he really loves. Now, poor Leah, she's unloved, and God sees it. God looks on the situation. He realizes that Rachel has beauty and love. And so he opens up God, Leah's womb, and she has a son. The story tells us that Leah shouts with exultation, God saw my affliction, and surely now my husband will love me. Then she gets pregnant again. Because the Lord heard me, I've, all, I've been given this son also. She has a third son. Now this time Jacob will be joined to me. But alas, it is not so. Four sons Leah bears, and Jacob still loves Rachel. Rachel, of course, at this point is furious. She screams at Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. And Jacob indignantly cries back, I'm not God. Rachel realizes what she needs to do. Jacob keeps sleeping with Leah because she's giving him sons, so Rachel kind of figures out what appeals to Jacob, and she says, Hey, Jacob, here's my maid, Bilhah. Why don't you take her? If she has sons, they'll be mine. Well, it didn't take a whole lot to convince Jacob of this plan. So Bilhah bears two sons. After the second one, Rachel celebrates, With mighty wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have won. Now Leah is smart too. She realizes how to get back into the game, and she says, Hey, Jacob, I've got a maid too. And by this point in the story, Jacob is clearly really enjoying himself. <laughs> two more sons are born. Well, by this time, we've got a bunch of kids running around. The oldest son, Reuben, is growing up. He's smart enough to realize what's going on in his family. And like a good son, he wants to help his mother, Leah, get ahead. So while out harvesting the wheat, right, Reuben notices some mandrakes, an aphrodisiac. And Reuben takes the roots and brings them to his mother, but Rachel sees what he's doing. Now, in recent weeks, Jacob had been staying in Rachel's bed, but she's still unable to get pregnant. After seeing Reuben and the main break, she thinks maybe this will help me. So first she goes to her sister and just tries being nice and simply asks for them, but Leah will have none of it. Instead, she looks sternly at her sister and says, You have stolen my husband from me. Now you want to take this gift from my son? So Rachel strikes the hard bargain. If I let Jacob sleep with you tonight, will you give me the man breaks? And Leah agrees. Jacob comes in from the mill. He's heading to Rachel's to clean up. Leah encounters him. At this point, I think she's done trying seduction and romance. She gets straight to the point. You have to come to my bed tonight. The Bible tells us I hire you in exchange for my son's memories. The result, Leah has two more sons and a daughter daughter. And after the sixth son of hers, Leah says, Now my husband will honor me. But we know who wishes to. And just as God saw Leah's need and blessed her with a child, God at this point in the story looks upon Rachel's need and opens her womb. Rachel has a son. She proclaims, God has taken my shame away. And then immediately upon that blessing, she says, now give me another son. What a story. And what a mess things are. Genesis begins with blessing. God has looked out on creation and said that it is very good. But then things went awry. Adam and Eve disobeyed. Cain murdered Abel. Ultimately, God calls Abraham and said that from his family, all the earth would be blessed. But so far in Genesis, this family doesn't seem to have learned some basic principles of blessing. The men don't seem to know how to treat the women. Even the women fight with one another, hurt each other, the privileged continue to mistreat the oppressed, children are put at risk, siblings fight with one another. Envy got in the way of Jacob, or Leah and Rachel's relationship. The great professor Bruce Molina writes that envy arises when we perceive that there are limited resources to go around. And in this particular case, for Leah and Rachel, there wasn't enough love and attention from Jacob to go around. Or to put it more 
more generally, they perceived blessing itself to be a limited resource that they had to compete for. This family's inability to treat each other well will continue to affect each generation. And you know that's true, you know the rest of the story. Yes, this is a story of the women competing for Jacob's sexual attention. It's a funny story. I think it's intended. But the dark truth is that this family is unable to be the blessing to the world that God originally envisioned when God called Abraham. This family has not learned how to bless each other. And if you take a moment to reflect on it, many of us, maybe most of us, have had this experience with our families. They've fallen short of the ideal that we had hoped for. The Reverend Michael Piazza writes that functional families are those where we learn honesty, intimacy, and trust. But that unfortunately for many of us, the family is the last place we learn those things. This particular family in Genesis has become locked in unhealthy emotional processes that keep repeating themselves over generations. Now all families have these sorts of processes, both healthy and unhealthy. Psychologists have learned that often the issues that individuals are dealing with are a reflection of their wider family systems. We clergy are taught that this is true about congregations as well. Families can be most wounding because they are the root of our identity and personhood. <clears throat> our parents and siblings in particular have great power over whether we feel loved, trusted, respected, and approved, or the opposites of these things. Some unhealthy family processes include passive-aggressive communication, scapegoating, triangulation, shaming, verbal or even physical abuse. Many people feel that they must perform in certain ways or be a certain type of person to gain their family's approval. Whether someone acts Whenever someone acts against the family system, particularly if they try to transcend it and become healthier, the system responds by trying to return to homeostasis and draw the person back into the unhealthy processes. And this is often how conflict occurs. Rabbi Edwin Friedman wrote the classic on family systems and emphasized that the path to health for the individual and the family involves self-differentiation. Differentiation means the capacity of a family member to define his or her own life's goals and values apart from the surrounding togetherness and pressures. So neither Leah nor Rachel were capable of defining their own self-worth apart from their role in the family system. And I think we have to admit it's probably a lot easier in our contemporary world where the individual, particularly women, have greater freedom of choice freedom of choosing the roles that they might inhabit. But Rabbi Friedman is clear that differentiation does not mean separating from family, but instead remaining part of the family while working on one's own life goals. It means developing strengths rather than staying focused on weaknesses. And he writes that ultimately it will bring more fundamental healing to the entire family. The gay and lesbian has contributed an important concept to discussions with family. Because we often encounter complicated relationships with our birth families, gays and lesbians have developed a new form of family and, and have labeled it a family of choice. And this concept, I think, now seems to function much more broadly for many people are in relationship with individuals who they call a family but may not be related to. Mike Piazza describes the family of choice as those people who enrich our lives rather than just those with whom we share some common genetic material. He continues, the ideal family which God dreams for each of us is made up of individuals who know us and love us as we are, not as they wish us to be. Well, this gives us insight into one of the primary ways to overcome unhealthy family processes, and that is unconditional love. Instead of setting rules for who a person must be or what they must do in order to be approved, 
The family who welcomes everyone to the table is the healthier family. And maybe this is a lesson that church helps us with, because at church we encounter people who are very different, and we have to, and very diverse, and we have to learn to get along with one another. Hopefully our motto, no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, is something that you apply in your life outside of this world. The ideal family would be one where everyone is pursuing their own life goals and thereby supporting each other's self-differentiation. And this ideal family is very unlike what we encounter in Genesis. This Genesis family keeps competing for attention as if there's not enough love and approval to share with everyone. Unlike the family in Genesis, the ideal family is one that has learned that there is enough blessing to go around for everyone. The final stanza of our opening hymn has reminded us that not alone we conquer, not alone we fall, in each loss or triumph, lose or triumph, all. Bound by God's far purpose, in one living whole, move we on together to the shining. It's a lesson of unity, welcome, and acceptance and love that our families must learn. A lesson that we must put into practice in our own families. There is enough blessing to go around.